Okay, so the, the theme I, I wrote about is communication. And I think it is very important. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, I begin with a quote uh, from uh, um, a book by Flaubert. Um, Human speech is like a cracked tin kettle on which we hammer out tunes to make bears dance when we long to move the stars. <laughs> um, okay, so it has been almost a year since I have been living at the KFA grounds. It has been an amazing experience. Personally, I can describe it as social rehabilitation. I decided to expose myself to a different culture and to a peaceful environment in order to change. One of my interests of inquiry while here has been communication, and specifically, to learn how to better relate and communicate verbally. In one of our most recent dialogues, I voiced my assumption that connecting with others is a fundamental human necessity, and that self-knowledge is mostly valuable as a means to facilitate this connection. Besides making the assumption known, I was also expressing how much I have come to value connecting with others. Indeed, my personal journey to learn the art of communicating thoughts and establishing a correspondence between minds, that is, to learn that sublime art which, though so remote from its origin, philosophers still behold at such a prodigious distance from its perfections, is serious. I have read J. Krishnamurti since 2005 and have decided to apply what I thought I learned to try it in my daily life, be what I am, whatever it is, and be aware of that to take it into the reality of daily living within relationship. I didn't understand. Instead of loving, I demanded others to be precise with their language. In addition, I thought I was making progress towards connecting with others in the way that I thought was right. I thought I cared. It seemed like I did. After all, wasn't I in the right and others in the wrong? Wasn't I the one who could talk about the source of pain and problems while others were trapped in these? Yet, it can easily be said that I couldn't go beyond words, for what was said was most important for me, and I thought I would get lost in words. In fact, I would try to avoid logical contradictions within the realm of words, unaware of what the mirror of relationship was reflecting which is even an even greater contradiction, <clears throat> disregarding deep aims while focusing on superficial means. I was like one who gets enraged at injustice, failing to see that rage itself is a primary source of injustice. In hindsight, and in an effort of self-preservation, I can say that I was not in the right environment to develop the care that was hidden under layerings of unhealthy cultures of being but that at least I tried. I define an unhealthy culture as one of barriers, judgments, and fears. Fear being primitive and antisocial, and completely undesirable if one is to care. However, during my year-long internship, I've had no excuses, since I have been provided with a space conducive to self-inquiry, peace, and safe exploration. It is here that I set to discover in you what Christian Murray is talking about when he says that when we comprehend something only verbally, which is what we call intellectual understanding, the word becomes enormously important. But when there is real understanding, the word is not important at all. It is merely a means of communication. Because what originally kept me to his teachings was a glimpse of the possibility to be free to commune, to be able to look at another and at myself with freshness, and especially without the pain of past hurts. 
without the authority of the past, of that which I had learned, and without creating new problems along the way, something easier said than done. My efforts to go beyond words began in trying to understand the religious beliefs of others, a place where abstract words had become very important in conveying deep and personal feelings about oneself, and where discrepancy is evident. So, for example, in order to connect with peoples of faiths, I would not focus on the words they use to describe their beliefs, that is, their conditioning, but rather would try to emphasize, empathize with their inner sense of being and with the feelings and emotions that such beliefs may be linked to. Hence, I would feel that I can be with them. I need not judge them. My happiness does not depend on their beliefs at all. They are not related to me. They are theirs. Even in the case where another's beliefs may seem to be in stark contradiction to mine, I found it most important not to be fearful, not to become defensive, and to primarily maintain a state of connection. Furthermore, the ideas that may seem to be threatening in verbal interactions are only so to the degree that another may willfully be putting me down. Yet in most civil interactions, some clarification would let me know that this is not the case. Most of our interactions are driven by the will to security, or as Christian Murray puts it, most of us demand to be secure psychologically, psychologically, in everything we do, think and feel. We want to be secure, certain. That is why we are so competitive. That is why we are jealous, greedy, envious, brutal. That is why we are so terribly concerned about things that don't matter at all. Given this, I find myself in a position that has to address this need for security in every interaction. Or in other words, I must take care not to diminish another's sense of self. This is something we automatically do in most interactions through a process called face saving, where such actions are often habitual and standardized practices. They are like traditional plays in a game or traditional steps in a dance. Yet, in the religious arena, we have, as humanity oftentimes failed. We live in a world ridden with prejudice and many outward displays of antisocial behavior. Nevertheless, I find that in going beyond words in order to understand what they mean at a deeper level within others, I am actively addressing the issue of religious prejudice. Ultimately, it doesn't matter how religious beliefs are described. What matters is that I find a way to touch, feel, what they are doing for the person who holds them. Yet, before I can think of understanding another's religious motivations, I must be able to understand others in everyday speech. To do so, I've done away with the illusion of the simplicity of talk. i found meaning to be in people and in their experiences, not in words and their definitions. Communication for me has become a flow of messages, of definitions of ourselves and others as we engage in talking. We want security. We want others to support us as we have invested ourselves in our world, in our words. Through our art of listening meetings, I've learned to slow down the mind's quick, automatic attempts to organize everything. I've been challenged to see myself differently. For example, by seeing feelings and needs as they are outwardly manifesting through imprecise and perhaps emotional talk. Indeed, it is our conditioned reactions that color an interaction. Within a verbal exchange, it is always two who are involved, so we can't jump to conclusions about the other when there are immediate changes in their behavior or when we feel a so-called energy shift. When this occurs, it is important to slow evaluations or judgments and to engage in describing behavior as factually as possible that is, to engage in observation, not judgments. I've learned that in difficult emotional situations, 
it is important to ask about motives and listen to the answers and that when we mind read, we are usually wrong especially considering that we see what we need to see in order to be internally consistent in order to feel good and to avoid cognitive dissonance or the presence of contradictory thoughts that can result in mental discomfort attributions of motives are especially dangerous since they are mostly made from assumptions not from facts once judgments are made we can ask ourselves why we made the judgments because when we do so we are trying to untangle the automatic emotional reactions from the thinking that is going on in our conscious mind that is trying to bring ourselves to the here and now Krishnamurti asks us is it possible to live without discontent let us consider the case in which the discontent that arises is due to a perception that our personal ideas are being challenged if we begin to control then we sometimes assume that the challenge is a personal matter we feel that another intends to make us angry or demean us and we begin to feel surges of anger or indignation we then begin to talk with these coloring our tone we use you are you should messages and mind read we also blame and avoid responsibility in this mode of talk of controlling we listen only for leverage to find something that we can use in our argument some weakness that we can exploit to win the other person over we don't listen to the other side of the story in this mode of talk we don't care about what they think but only if they understand and agree with us in this situation there is great discontent lurking in the shadows overall there is no positive motivation in the exchange nor a willingness to connect but rather to escape and if the other retaliates the situation can escalate into anger towards an even more competitive and heavy exchange when we are in a competitive mode we are responding to and enacting invisible assumptions about the combative ways of discovering truth proving the other wrong assuming there is a right answer listening only to find flaws in their thinking defending our assumptions as objective truths and seeking a conclusion that ratifies our position we place a premium on being right on winning if we are disagreed with we trivialize others or tell them they have incorrect facts or demand proof ignoring or interrupting or speaking in a patronizing way this can go around and around until somebody finds a way to silence the other or to escape the scene we then engage in you are the scriptures that do not describe the surface behavior but the person's essence for example you are stupid the structure of the sentence forces the other to see it as a personal attack the implication being that there is something wrong at their genetic level <laughs> We then do anything to be emotionally right, blaming, venting, withholding, sarcasm, etc. The interaction becomes a struggle over what was said and what was meant by what was said, and most importantly, who is to blame. We believe we know what others meant because we infer their intentions from our feelings about their behavior we are feeling bad so they must have meant to treat us badly somebody has to be blamed for my sadness and anger and it must be the other person it can't be me because that would mean i would have to take responsibility for my behavior this ends up undermining the connection of the relationship as we begin to take conversation personally we need to stop and describe how we are feeling to take some time out and see the disagreement from the other's point of view we can suggest to the other to do the same this space reduces the intensity of our triggered emotions we can then think about why others don't see the situation our way we need to understand why others don't agree with our point of view 
and to examine how our ideas may be affecting them negatively, thereby allowing ourselves to come back to the discussion in a more composed way. We will then make fewer judgments. We may not get what we want, but at least the relationship is sustained and communication remains open. This will allow us to approach a possible subsequent discussion more productively. The threat has been diminished and we will hopefully not be as reactionary. In dialogue, connection is maintained in the face of differences and disagreements. In dialogue, we are together to attempt to solve the problem. This means we are more focused on looking at ourselves rather than on others. We are also equals in dialogue talk. We assume our story is obvious only to us and that others have their story. And in order to have all the information, we listen to the other's story. We see how it is that we contributed to the situation. We make a conscious effort to manage our emotions and to seek understanding of the other person before we lay out our points. We commit to understanding and to creating a space between our judgments and our reactions. As Krishnamurti puts it, when man becomes aware of the movement of his own consciousness, he will see the division between the thinker and the thought, the observer and the observed, the experiencer and the experienced. He will discover that this division is an illusion. Then only is there pure observation, which is insight without any shadow of the past. This timeless insight brings about deep radical mutation in the mind. That is, our memory and conditioning affect our thoughts. And we must be aware of this in order to consciously bring ourselves to the here and now. The observer can only be ourselves, since we observe through our memory and judgments. And the thinker's state of being is heavily dictated by the content of his thoughts. By realizing the illusion of these divisions, we are better able to connect with others. Okay. So thank you for listening. And if there are any questions, there are most.